If you're interested in doing time series regression, this video is of vital importance. In the last video, I said that in principle, we could do the same things as we do with cross-sectional data. However, if you use time series data, you have to make sure that some preconditions are fulfilled because otherwise you would get um, nonsense results. And in practice, we call this spurious regression. So you would get, or you would do spurious regression. And let's explain spurious regression with a simple example. We want to estimate the effect of the number of economic historians in the United States on wages in manufacturing in the United States. So our regression equation becomes wage at time t is equal to alpha plus beta times hist, the number of economic historians at time t plus epsilon t. And you have yearly data ranging from 1945 until 2015. You run a regression and take a look at the summary statistics and you see, wow, okay, great. R squared is equal to 0.0 or 0.9, sorry. 0.9 and beta right here beta this one over there is highly significant and has a very high value so did we just discover the holy grail of economics it seems as if wages in manufacturing are driven by the number of economic historians well unless you have a very inflated ego um, this should ring all alarms what we have right here is in fact or what we did is a spurious regression. The result is complete nonsense and tells us absolutely nothing. Now, why is that? Well, let's take a look at the plot of both time series, okay? So let's say we plot both time series. So we measure our observations over the years. And let's say this is the plot for wages. And the plot may look something like this. So this is the plot for wages. And as you can see, it follows some sort of linear trend. Now let's also plot our um, data set or data on the number of economic historians in the United States. So again, we measure the number of economic historians on years and let's call it H, okay? And the number of economic, or the plot for the number of economic historians looks like this. And again, it has a linear trend in there. Well, sort of linear trend. Um, well, what you see is that both time series increase over time. And this is something that we encounter in many economic time series. Many economic time series share a common trend, albeit there is no causal relationship between both of them. And because both of them share the same deterministic trend, you get a very high R squared and highly significant results. So as we see, we can't work with variables if they share some sort of deterministic trend. Now, how can we get a, or how can we actually account for that? Well, that's fairly simple. Let's rerun the regression, but this time we add a deterministic trend into the equation. So the equation actually becomes, let me write that down, rage, or let me do that with another color. So we include a deterministic trend in our regression equation so that our equation becomes wage at time t is equal to alpha plus beta 1 times hist, the number of economic historians at time t plus beta 2 times the trend, let's call this trend, uh, yeah, let's call it trend at time t plus 
an error term, epsilon t. So trend is simply the number of periods. Okay, so um, trend is just um, the years. So trend only represents a linear trend. Now we rerun the regression and the results are, well, r squared is still pretty high. It's still 0.9. Nothing has changed. But this time, and this is the very important part, beta 1 is actually insignificant, but beta 2 is highly significant. This is the important part. So beta 1 is actually insignificant and beta 2 is highly significant. So you can see that it was only the common trend that explains the rise in wages in manufacturing and not the number of economic historians. So make sure you always detrend your data. Well, there are several methods of how you can detrend your data, but putting it into the regression is, well, I think the most convenient way to do so. Sadly, it could happen, and it's very likely that it does happen, that either one or both time series contains what we call a unit root. Unit root. If this is the case, even using detrended variables will, uh, will result in spurious regression. Now, what is a unit root? Let's take two examples, okay? In the first example, our data does not follow a trend. So, we don't have data following a trend. So, let me plot the data for you. Okay, there you go. Now, we have some mean, okay? Because, again, our data is not following any trend. But take a look at this. Okay, great, right? We don't have a tr uh, we don't have to detrend our data, so can we directly use it for our regression? No, no, we can't. We cannot use this data for our regression. Note that the time series, and let me get another color for that. Note that the time series seems to be very persistent in time. Okay, so this is the key. Our time series is actually very persistent. Uh, in time. So the in other words, let's let's phrase it like this. The value of our variable at time t plus 1 is actually or nearly identical to the variable at time t. So it's highly persistent. Only in some short periods does the time series change dramatically, but in all the other periods it's really it's totally persistent. So it's kind of like if you do a regression and you would say, you know, um, x at time t is equal to alpha plus beta 1 x t minus 1 plus an error term with the restriction that this coefficient right here is, you know, equal to 1. And this would mean that our time series is actually extremely significant. And if that is the case, then you have what we call a unit root. Now, um, if actually, or if that happens, um, we would violate one of the major preconditions um, that we just stated. So we cannot allow our data to contain a unit root if we don't want to end up with doing spurious regression, right? Um, also, it could happen that you have both a unit root and a linear trend. And it might look something like this. So let me plot this data. So you have some sort of linear trend. Might look like this. But your data looks like this. So again, it's very persistent in time along a linear trend or whatever. In this case, it's just a linear trend. So this is obviously a problem and we can't use this data for estimations because again, it's very persistent in time if you would just subtract the linear trend. Right? You would basically end up with the same or with this time series over here. 
The only difference is that this time series contains a linear trend. This does not. However, both time series contain a unit root. So in this case, all we would do is take this equation and would just add a uh, linear trend to it. But this wouldn't change that our time series is still highly persistent. Right? So what can we do to get around that problem? So let's say your data contains a unit root either without or with a trend. So what you do is you take the first difference, okay? Most of the time you take the first difference. So take the first difference of your data. And that is what it says to be, the difference between period t and period t minus 1. And in most time series, this will eliminate the linear trend. So if you have a trend in your data, what the first difference will do, so what this does is it will eliminate your trend and it will get rid of the unit root in most cases. Okay? So, in most cases, it will eliminate your linear trend and it will get rid of the unit root. If there is no trend and um, no unit root in your data, then we would say your data is actually stationary. So, then your data would be stationary. And that is the major precondition I'm talking about. So, frame this word, okay? So print it and frame it. We want our data to be stationary. You can only do time series regression with stationary data. Now, how do I know if my data is stationary or not? Well, there's a simple test for that and it is called, and I'll write that down for you, the augmented dickey fuller test. So we could use the augmented dickey Fuller test. So, augmented Dickey Fuller test. And what the Dickey Fuller test does is it basically tests if um, this coefficient right over here is actually equal to 1. Now, this is basically what the Dickey Fuller test um, does. And the augmented version of the Dickey Fuller test also tests if your data is what we call trend stationary. So test if it's trend stationary. So it tests whether your data is stationary or trend stationary. Now, hold on, you might say. First you tell me to eliminate a trend and now you say the data could be stationary even if there's a trend. No, um, what it means is that if you only, so trend stationary means that if you eliminate the trend, then your data is stationary. That is what um, trend stationary um, um, means. However, if you do not eliminate your trend, your data is obviously not stationary. So keep in mind that if your data is trend stationary, just eliminate the trend. So um, you could include a trend in a regression, for example. So there would be no need for differencing if your data is trend stationary. And a trend stationary or trend stationary data would look like this. So let's say you have a linear trend. However, your time series fluctuates around this trend. Okay, so this is a um, trend stationary process. And one last thing. Uh, I said that most unit roots and trends can be eliminated by taking the first difference. There are also processes that are still not stationary if you take the first difference. This might happen if your data contains a unit root and an exponential trend, for example. So let's say you have an exponential trend and your data is um, or contains a unit root. Then first differencing is not enough. Uh, in this case, you might take the difference of the difference. So this was a lot of information. Make sure that you digest all of it. And also, I would encourage you to read the following book. It's called Introductory Introductory Time Series
with R. So this is a very good book on um, all the uh, time series um, topics.